Welcome to EEP Africa's webinar on cooling solutions, the interplay between business models and technology in sub-Saharan Africa. My name is uh, Chieza Mazaiwana. I'm a portfolio manager at EEP Africa. I will just give a brief introduction of EEP. Uh, we are a multi-donor open-ended trust fund, and our current donors are Austria, Denmark, Iceland, Finland, Norway, Switzerland, and the Nordic Development Fund. We provide early stage grant catalytic financing for innovative clean energy projects. Our current focus areas are Southern Africa and East Africa, and our portfolio is spread across 15 countries. Next slide, please. So today marks the beginning of EEP Africa's Knowledge Week. We are hosting a series of online events that includes sessions on our upcoming call for proposals and another discussion on unlocking carbon finance. We also look forward to announcing EEP Africa 2023 Project of the Year and our rising energy leader during the week. So please register and tune in to be part of these exciting events. Next slide, please. Now let's uh, dive into the order of the day. Uh, so uh, just to speak through the agenda, Energy Saving Trust uh, is going to give us an overview of the cooling sector. And after that, we're going to dive into a discussion uh, with our panelists who will share their experiences in investing in cooling solutions. We will also hear from uh, two entrepreneurs from EEP Africa's portfolio who are providing cold chain services in agricultural value chains, followed by a question and answer session. So if you have a question, please post this uh, through the chat box and I'll be able to post this to our panel right at the end of the discussion. We shall also share uh, some handouts, uh, which are sector documents on cooling during the session, which you can download and uh, have a look at later. Uh, now to introduce the session, uh, we all know that increasing access to cooling solutions is critical for health and nutrition and can uh, reduce food waste, provide economic opportunities for farmers and businesses, as well as reduce the burden on vulnerable populations. New technologies and business models for off-grid cooling solutions are in the rise. And uh, with the use of innovation and digital solutions, however, we continue to see a pressing concern that revolves around ensuring both productivity and accessibility, especially for economically marginalized uh, at the bottom of the pyramid. So I will tell you a personal experience uh, that I had. A couple of years ago, a local off-grid company imported two solar-powered refrigerators here in Zimbabwe, where I'm based, uh, and they uh, wanted to test the technology before distributing it widely in the market. I had gone uh, to their office for a monitoring visit, and they showed me the fridge. It was this little small box with a solar panel, and I was so excited, and my immediate thoughts where I need to get this for my grandmother in the village. They deployed one of the, the, the refrigerated in a selected uh, household in a rural setup and kept one at their office to also test the performance of, uh, of the technology themselves. Rural households, excited as I was, bought some meat, uh, which they estimate would last them over uh, the coming week. Day one, day two, the meat began going bad. The company was monitoring daily how uh, and how did they monitor. So they made sure that they're monitoring the system daily at the office, but they also needed to monitor at this rural household. So how did they do that? They had to be calling three times a day and talking to the customer, asking, is it working? And the customer would go in the fridge and check the temperature using the back of their hand and say, yes, it's cold inside, but we really don't understand why the meat is going bad. The company was puzzled as well. 
after about four days, the customer was convinced that solar energy is not strong enough for refrigerators. And remember, I was a curious uh, customer. I was interested uh, to buy the system. So I called the company about two weeks later to follow up uh, just to get to know how the test was going. And the entrepreneur told me, Piazza, I really don't know what the hell is wrong with this fridge. And at that point, little did we know that different fruits uh, have different cooling requirements. The temperature needed for storing milk is different from storing meat or tomatoes or blueberries. And that was learning. Learning for the company, for the customer, and learning for the market as a whole. And a key takeaway there for me was, the, was that uh, it is important to understand, one, your customer's needs, uh, what their cooling needs are, what is it that they need to refrigerate, and then understanding the technology itself and how it functions, and bringing all that together and providing solutions that speak to the customer's needs. So today, uh, our panel of speakers are going to discuss trends in technology development and innovation around business models, the inclusive delivery of cooling solutions in the markets. I now invite Chris. Um, next slide, please. Chris is going to give us an overview of the sector. Chris is a technical program manager at Energy Saving Trust, uh, who are the core secretariat of the Efficiency for Access Coalition. Since 2018, Chris has been managing the Efficiency for Access Research and Development Fund, which is an innovation fund providing early stage support to innovators in the off-grid appliances sector. Chris, take it away. Thank you, Chetza. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so, so thank you for the introduction. Um, and as Chetza mentioned, I, I've been leading the Efficiency for Access Research and Development Fund uh, for the past uh, five and a half years. Um, so it's an innovation fund um, that we've been, we've been actively working with um, organizations focused on developing innovative off-grid cooling solutions. Um, so the, the Research and Development Fund is um, part of the Low Energy Inclusive Appliances Program, um, sometimes referred to as, as LEA, and is funded by UK Aid and the IKEA Foundation. Um, LEA is the Ayrton Fund co-lead for Sustainable Cooling for All. Uh, and next month at the Transforming Energy Access Forum event in Kigali, uh, we, we, we will be running a calling session that we'd love for you to join. Um, have a look on the LinkedIn page of Transforming Energy Access and you'll be able to find out more information there and register if you're interested. Um, so I only have around five minutes to cover what is a, you know, a large sector in calling. Um, so it'd be more of an introduction and hopefully set us up nicely for uh, an engaging conversation, hearing from some of the, the key players in the sector. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So, um, firstly, I'd like to introduce the Efficiency for Access Coalition. Um, so, it's made up of 20 funders and investors, um, and as Chetza mentioned, Energy Saving Trust, um, along with CLASP, are the Secretariat for the Efficiency for Access Coalition as part of the LEA program. And I'm highlighting the, the coalition because the off-grid cooling sector um, is inherently complex, um, as Chet just mentioned, there's lots of moving parts um, and it's important to get it right. Uh, and we're here to play a, a role in coordinating support and moving the needle in terms of growth and development of the sector. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, so what do we mean by off-grid cold storage? Um, so there are often different um, terms used to describe terminologies that provide cold. Um, so sometimes it can be cold chain, cold rooms, cold stores, uh, cold storage, uh, the list goes on. And so for the purposes of this session, we're talking about technologies such as solar powered walking cold rooms. Um, so uh, kind of shipping container sized uh, rooms, or they can vary, but so let's say as an average, um, that are, uh, let's call it go cold going into that room of you know, different temperatures, um, storing different produce or products. Um, so the refrigerators, um, so 
refrigerators powered by solar and other specific cooling solutions such as milk chillers, um, ice makers as well. Um, these are often uh, typically operating in either the agriculture, agricultural or like small retail, micro enterprise and health vaccine kind of sectors. Um, and there are product developers who sit across these different sectors, as it were. Um, there are product developers who started off in the medical vaccine space, um, and then they've now transferred their technology um, into the agriculture uh, or micro enterprise sector. And so a concept I'd like to introduce uh, today um, is thinking about cold storage solutions um, as critical infrastructure. Um, it's not really a phrase that or perspective that we um, that we don't often use in the energy access world, um, but it can be an important reframing. Um, and organisations such as ACES and GAIN have been leading this concept, uh, and the EAP Africa team uh, will share a link to to both of those reports um, either in the handout in the webinar or after this webinar. And so at the bottom of this, <clears throat> this slide, you can see different forms of technologies that I've mentioned. So on the left, you can see the handling of tomatoes and other produce in a cold room. Uh, in the middle is Amped Innovations Solar Power Refrigerator that the Efficiency for Access R&D Fund um, supported. Uh, and on the right, you can see Promethean Power's Milk Chiller um, in India. If you just go to the next slide, please. So on this slide, um, hopefully you can see it clearly. Um, on this slide, you can see the funding being provided to the, the cooling sector on the top left, um, which shows uh, a trend of increasing funds to the, to the sector over the past 10 years or so. Um, and there are many reasons why cooling is needed and there's a kind of growing acceptance around these reasons. And I guess the key point here um, is that um, we've moved beyond kind of the piloting stage and there's a challenge now that we're going to need to deliver um, and address um, the need with solutions basically. Um, so affordability is proving to be one of the kind of key challenges for off-grid cold storage. Um, and so the primary reason is because the system needs to include some kind of reliable power source. So usually solar PV, and, and some kind of energy storage, which is, is very different compared to traditionally kind of grid connected cooling technologies. And so on the bottom right of this slide shows the sales of uh, solar powered refrigerators by Goggler affiliates. So maybe one thing to say is that 2023, um, that's only half of the, um, the sales reported so far, because um, we've only just kind of got gathering the, the data. Um, and so this is by Goggle Affiliates in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, by West Africa and East Africa. And you can see that in 2019, um, just under 7,000 refrigerators were sold um, in West Africa uh, and just under 4,000 um, in East Africa. Um, and obviously the COVID-19 pandemic uh, hit in 2020 um, and that impacted the sales of refrigerators um, as solar home system companies and other distributors kind of focused on their core and generally smaller or less expensive products. Um, and we're now seeing um, a growing number of companies focused um, and, and specializing in solar refrigerators. Um, so we're seeing an uptick in sales. Um, however, there's increasing kind of competition from cheap AC refrigerators being solarized for, for use in, in off-grid areas. We don't have any data uh, as efficiency for access on the sales of walking cold rooms. So that's why I've just highlighted the um, refrigerator units. Um, if you go to the, the next slide, please. So this slide is just kind of sh showing how it's uh, it's complicated um, and that there is like, there's no silver bullet. Um, it, it requires uh, a systems thinking approach where all the key stakeholders work together uh, and work towards improving the enabling environment to support the development of a nascent market like the off-grid cooling sector um, and, and you know is right now basically. Um, so technology innovation itself is is not enough um, but equally nor is just business models in isolation or access to to kind of cheap cap capital it, it requires this kind of overall integrated approach um, and so there's a need for key inputs such as access to patient capital for early stage innovators um, but also improved policy support and to develop skilled workforces that can install 
and maintain uh, cooling systems. Um, that is all from me, so I'll hand back to Chetza. Thank you, Chris, uh, for the framing remarks, and indeed affordability is one of the, the challenges uh, that is highlighted within the sector, and we will dive a little bit more into the discussion uh, as we rock in our panelists. Uh, to also hear these perspectives, uh, you know, you spoke about the ecosystems approach in uh, tackling and increasing deployment for cooling solutions. Uh, so, with that being said, uh, let me introduce our panel. So, we are joined by four panelists. Um, first one I will introduce is Chianda. Chianda is a manager in the demand jobs and livelihoods team at GIAP. His work focuses on stimulating the productive use of uh, renewable energy in underserved communities to create jobs and improve livelihoods, which is a critical pillar uh, in GIAP's overall mission. And we are joined by another Chris, uh, Chris from Acumen, Chris Emwot. He is the head of energy investments at Acumen, where he supports Acumen's regional investment teams to invest in innovators uh, that are developing solutions to tackle the challenges of poverty through access to energy. And then we have uh, Dennis. Uh, Dennis is a Kenyan entrepreneur and he is also CEO of Socofresh. He is passionate about solving complex problems affecting Africans through business interventions. And he is keen to leave a huge mark of positive change in the society in his lifetime. Now, when I went through his biography, wearing my energy access hat, I think we should rephrase it to, uh, Dennis, you'd want to leave a huge mark of positive change in the society uh, before you reach your end of life. And uh, last but not Tracy, uh, Tracy Kimathi is the founder of Greedy and a driven leader with an impressive short-term uh, track record. She is a strong vision, uh, she's a strong visionary and supports sustainable uh, development across Africa through renewable energy. Tracy has coordinated Pan-African networks and relevant resources in setting up Aridi. Now to kick off uh, the discussion, I will ask all panelists to uh, open up your cameras. Uh, and if I may start with Chris Amort. Uh, Chris, you recently published an article that speaks to three approaches to making productive use of energy accessible to all, reaching the bottom of the pyramid. Based on that article and Acumen's role in investing in cold storage solutions, may you please highlight uh, the emerging business models that you have seen being implemented in the market? Chris? Yeah, absolutely. So, um... So yeah, so at Acumen we're really focused on tackling the challenges of people living in poverty um, and cooling can have some really major impacts there. So to date we've invested in, in three different cold chain companies across India, East Africa and West Africa and that's across quite a wide variety of, of different business models. So we've seen micro entrepreneurs um, running frozen food businesses, we've looked at um, agricultural buyers who are using cooling to access premium markets and then we've also looked at community-owned infrastructure in the dairy value chain. Um, it's a really, it's very much an early stage of the sector, and so there's, there's huge room for both innovation and, and also a huge opportunity for investment here. Um, there's kind of three key categories um, where we see the real impact of cold chain and, and uh, poverty, and, and really impacting people living in poverty. One is around existing entrepreneurs. Um, where they're already spending a huge amount on, on cooling. So running diesel generators to power small fridges, working on a very unreliable grid, which is really affecting their business. So traders and shopkeepers, those kind of things. The second is around large cold rooms and bulk chillers. And so here we're, we're seeing companies targeting farmers 
And a critical element which we've seen um, highlighting success there and highlighting the ability to reach that base of the pyramid is where companies are acting as a buyer of produce. So they're not just being a technology provider, but actually being a, an agricultural aggregator in many ways. Um, one area which we which we haven't invested in yet, but is really interesting and a real need within the sector is around logistics and kind of broad, broader cold chain. So taking um, products to, from the farm gate right through to the end consumer is there's there's a whole variety of different companies that kind of need it in that link. And there's definitely a lot of room for, for innovation in, in kind of wholesale markets and transport and logistics. Um, and that's that's probably the most least developed sector that we've seen. And then kind of one other area which we, we're not talking about today, but I think worth kind of highlighting is, is household cooling as well. You know, fans have been one of the biggest drivers of the sale of solar home systems um, in West Africa, for example, where we've done a lot of work. And it's a critical area for, um, for climate resilience. And so I think uh, an area that we should just kind of mention there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, and indeed, we're going to hear a bit more about, uh, you know, that experience with companies being an aggregator uh, of the produce and not just providing the service uh, as, as we speak to the entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, thank you for uh, that overview. And I will quickly move on to Chianda. Uh, Chianda, from a lens of an impact investor, could you please tell us why cold storage is important for the sector and what indications are there that this is a promising space? Uh, thanks, Jeff. I'll give it from the perspective, uh, from Jeff's perspective, which is that of an impact investor, although yeah, I think it's our, our broad definition is very is very unique. But um our like our goals are around carbon access, jobs and livelihoods, as, as you've highlighted, as you've alluded to earlier. So um, when we look, when you're looking at access, what we or what we, we, we work on primarily or what we're seeing is prim primarily is, uh, challenges in, in getting energy investment sustainable largely are largely attributed to the demand risk, which uh, is more so for, for solutions such as mini grids and other types of distributed renewables uh, going to the sun market. So why we are really excited about cold storage is that we've already seen or we're already seeing from work on the ground that we're supporting around pairing cold storage, uh, cold storage with mini grid power supply is a really is a really important driver of of of, of up, uptake of, of, of energy within these communities, which uh, in the case of Nigeria has been has been quite a challenge and you're seeing that one walk-in cold storage room can account for can account for 120 uh, customers or the consumption of 120 customers so we see that as an important driver not only for demand but also for um, the economic development side of it because prior to the launch of GIA um, some some uh, foundational research done by the Rockefeller Foundation, which is one of our backers, showed that no uh, country can escape or can find themselves out of poverty without having that uptake or that on-ramp of energy usage. And so that's one perspective. The other perspective is uh, from most importantly what I focus on, which is the jobs and livelihoods perspective. Um, and so as you already know, the cold storage solutions are talking about are mainly for economic activities and especially within uh, communities that are typically underserved we know that uh, we know that from the data from uh, our friends at efficiency for access for example is that each unit of, of each unit that is sold be it a, a chest freezer or a walking cold room has uh, has a tremendous knock-on effect in terms of the number of jobs uh, that it can create so it, it's a really important topic especially for uh, for the team that i sit in that we uh, not only focus on increasing the supply of this of these units of these life changing units, but also ensuring that they land in in in, in ecosystems that allow it to thrive. And then uh, the last but not least uh, perspective is from from climate. So uh, we do know that uh, it, 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 it's important to note that the impact of of food loss and food waste on the environment, and that's where cold storage just really uh, plays an important role. In, in, in avoiding or in avoiding or reducing the emissions that that, that are born out of this uh, of this systemic challenge, uh, but, uh, that's just a couple of perspectives from uh, from what the, the work that we do. 
Thank you, Chianda, and uh, a very important uh, points you've touched on there. And I would also like to add on, on, on the environmental side, when you look at uh, our targets for achieving net zero, uh, CLASP um, you know, released a publication uh, just last year before COP, and uh, they, it speaks about the uh, net zero heroes and four out of uh, the ten that are listed are relating to to cooling, uh, which is which is great. And uh, before we hear from the entrepreneurs and uh, you know that impact and job creation that you spoke to, I'd like to come back to Chris uh, Belland. Uh, Chris, the Efficiency for Access uh, R&D Fund has been support uh, supporting uh, cooling innovators since 2019. And over the years, we have seen dramatic improvements in technology, uh, particularly in improving efficiency. Can you please share more about technology trends that you have seen in the sector? Thanks. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, so under efficiency for access, there's a kind of broader remit of uh, so, you know, supporting uh, the sector um, across multiple sectors in terms of appliances. Um, and, and the R&D fund is kind of the, the primary mechanism in terms of working directly with innovators, but there's also uh, research and, and testing and quality assurance that can, can basically support uh, technology development. Um, under the R&D fund, uh, we have uh, worked with a number of um, cooling innovators. <clears throat> um, and I guess a couple of things that spring to mind, I guess, well, one is that a key enabler for the off-grid kind of solar powered cold storage sector is the obviously the reducing cost of solar panels um, and the, the proliferation of, of lithium ion batteries that's kind of the the initial catalyst I guess um, and then within the lifetime of the R&D fund um, we've seen the growth um, and development of thermal storage or ice batteries or phase change materials whatever you want to call it um, which reduces the reliance on yeah things like lithium ion batteries. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, it can reduce the cost, um, improve the affordability. And there's some examples on the efficiency for access, um, uh, the R&D from kind of page um, around how innovators have um, are managing to basically reduce the overall cost of their units. Um, the other kind of key ones is, uh, to, again, I guess coming back to the framing kind of comments was around, Improve, you know, overcoming affordability. Um, so the integration of Pago um, into refrigerators um, and other units um, is is an important one in terms of um, improving affordability <clears throat> and the access to digital digital, digital finance. Um, but it can also only go so far as well. And there's a report that we published um, last year around that, around the zero, uh, the road to net zero. Uh, zero interest, sorry. Um, and so that there's that report, which was kind of highlighting the, the, the limitations or the challenges around how far Pago can go, basically. <clears throat> and then um, the kind of last one I would say is the, the integration of uh, IoT or remote monitoring. <clears throat> so that helps to improve the performance um, of of units um, and um, helps you know uh, companies help to monitor what how their their units are performing um, and improves the overall kind of customer experience uh, within the off grid cold storage um, space. So the example that you mentioned at the very beginning, Chet, so hopefully remote monitoring would would avoid that scenario and, and sort of empower everyone involved basically in terms of overcoming those uh, those challenges. So yeah, that was just a couple of thoughts uh, from me. Thanks, Chris. Um, and yeah, now with the way technology has evolved, we're seeing you know less and less uh, challenges for the entrepreneurs themselves, uh, but also you know increasing affordability for the for the consumer. Um, and now let's hear uh, from the entrepreneurs. Uh, Tracy, uh, we'll start off with you. Uh, Tracy, you're part of uh, EEP Africa's portfolio, and if I may say, you are uh, the youngest entrepreneur that uh, we have on the portfolio, and very impressive uh, work that you have done, uh, which we applaud you for. 
May you please uh, briefly introduce your company uh, and your service offering, and as well as get into detail on the challenges that you have faced in the implementation of the project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is Tracy Kimathi. I'm the founder of Baridi. Um, and essentially, um, sorry, I'm trying to share my webcam. All right, if you can see me. Yes, I'm the founder of Baridi, and Baridi is a solar-powered cold storage solution provider that targets the livestock industry, so that's both meat and milk. And I'll just piggyback what Chris has said. So we started our startup with solar-powered cold storage solutions that look at sub-zero technology with lithium-ion batteries. Um, however, there was high-level capex that was associated with that, so then we were almost forced to kind of go into the thermal storage solution elements that are continuously into R&D. Uh, and we were kind of, um, again, because of the high level capex that that kind of came with, we had to get into partnership with Inficold, which is an Indian based manufacturer that enabled us to go into thermal storage technology. And they kind of offer us a uh, continuous R&D on sub-zero technology so that we can enable um, continuous research and development within the meat and fish industry within the sub-zero technology. So we went from lithium ion technology that enabled sub-zero um, temperatures of up to negative 18 degrees and we kind of um, in a sense went backwards to thermal storage technology that kind of uh, up until now only has a negative four degrees celsius but is continuously um, uh, R&Ding into that uh, sub-zero um, element. Uh, we also have continuous um, development in IoT so we use RFID technology in uh, in our remote monitoring. So that essentially means that we not only monitor solar energy generation, but we also monitor what is actually entering into our cold rooms. So we can uh, monitor what is inside our cold rooms, what quantity of meat is inside our cold rooms, what quality of meat, what timelines it came into our cold rooms, what timelines it came out, what temperature it was exposed, and etc. And uh, because of this and because of the affordability of the thermal storage, we're able to go into B2B sales. Um, and we're kind of even seeing ourselves evolving from B2C pay as you store to B2B uh, direct sale models. Um, again, just uh, because of the thermal storage element, uh, because of the IoT RFID, uh, but also because of the fact that the whole world is kind of uh, understanding the importance of uh, cold chain technology in reducing food loss. Uh, right now, I'm in uh, Japan, and we're essentially, um, you know, meeting up with corporates. And these corporates want to enter the Kenyan markets, and they want warehouses. Um, that are filled with cold storage solutions with uh, not only uh, sub-zero technology in terms of thermal storage because they want to go off grid, but they also want to monitor it. They want to monitor the logistics um, from Japan uh, and they have uh, Kenyan uh, goods into it. So again, like my, my experience within the cold stain sorry cold storage technology has gone from uh starting the sub-zero um technology with uh solar powered cold rooms with sub-zero tech with lithium-ion batteries we kind of involved into thermal storage and with that uh we've kind of evolved into the b2b business and we used to do pay-as-you store but uh, what people need to understand is B2C doesn't really uh, generate as much revenue as you would think it does. But what you're seeing is corporates are kind of coming into the Kenyan ecosystem. Like you, you find logistic corporates who need warehousing for pharmaceuticals, who need warehousing for livestock products. Um, and they need to monitor this aspect from the headquarters in Japan or in India. Um, and this is essentially where we're heading. Uh, we start with BTC with the lithium ion batteries and we evolve into thermal storage uh, and B2B. Um, and, and this is how the cold chain um, ecosystem is kind of growing into, right? So um, you're not limiting yourself into this B2C like pay-as-you-store model, but you're kind of growing with the 
international corporates who want to evolve into the African ecosystem. And you're also using um, IoT RFID technology to, to kind of go into that. Yeah, so thank you. That's that's what I need to say for now. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Tracy. And, and what I hear from um, your presentation is lots of opportunity um, you know, for the sector itself with more and more corporates coming in. So, you know, opportunity for local companies, for companies that are already uh, in the market, but also the ability to move with the trends and to evolve and to say, wait a minute, okay, this is for us as a, as a company and as a business to survive. We also need to look at A, B, C, D. This is how we need to structure our model. Um, thank you, thank you for that. And we'll quickly move on to uh, Dennis. And uh, Dennis, uh, if you may, please briefly introduce your company and your service offering, and also uh, tell us the story of how you have uh, pivoted uh, your business model and uh, you know the changes that have ha have happened since you started this project. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so my name is Dennis Karema, and um, uh, thanks for this forum. Uh, so we. Uh, cold storage and market linkage company based in Kenya, working in the fresh produce value chains. Uh, I think I agree with uh, all the sentiments shared here about the fact that uh, we have a cold storage deficit across almost every sector uh, in Kenya and most of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so we chose to focus uh, primarily on uh, fresh produce um targeting smallholder farmers targeting high value um uh, value chains where uh, cold storage can actually be able to unlock um income increase as well as uh, uh, reduce on post harvest losses um and uh, we were uh, fortunate to be part of ep i think uh, uh, we joined ep at a point where we had uh, developed the uh, business concept for one value chain and we really needed to test it out uh, across uh, multiple value chains here in Kenya. As you know, uh, working uh, in uh, the fresh value chain uh, space means uh, understanding seasonality, understanding that different uh, produce requires different kinds of temperature requirements. Um, and uh, I think through the project, uh, some of the key uh, things that happened is one, we actually were able to develop uh, an additional business model uh, where we found that there were organizations and outgrower schemes that already had figured out their uh, market uh, in logistics and just needed uh, cooling integrated into them. And so we ended up actually having two different business models. So you have a business model for um, uh, aggregators who are already established, who know where to take their produce. And uh, the barrier for them was that um, uh, the uh, cooling uh, infrastructure that existed before one mostly required them to actually do brick and mortar cold storages. Uh, and so with the solar powered the mobile cold storages, it meant that we could set up cooling for our grower schemes anywhere in the country within a short turnaround time. Uh, we are obviously uh, leveraging on IoT systems that enable um, uh, monitoring of this uh, uh, technology, the use of the uh, cold storage, setting of temperature and humidity, and everything that they need within that environment. So. Uh, I think EP is catalytic in that way. I also think that uh, the EP team is also quite uh, well connected to uh, different other organizations that can either provide insights, technical support, and also when it comes to raising of investment, uh, they are able to also connect you to potential investors because uh, EP it funding comes at a point where you have a proven concept that you need to uh, scale, test some of your riskiest assumptions, and then move on to uh, potentially uh, equity investors. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Um, yeah, you've touched on uh, you know one of the major challenges from the companies and entrepreneurs' perspective: the issue of you know access to finance. Uh, as Tracy highlighted in her presentation. She spoke about high capex so many times. You know, the business requires uh, a huge upfront cost to be able to 
uh, to establish and and uh, and implement. So speaking to that, I will go back to Chris, Chris Belland. Um, you have just closed an ACTEC call and you sit in a position in the sector where you interact with a lot of startup companies. What can companies do to become more attractive to investors? after we come in and you know inject the patient capital or you know the initial catalytic grant what can companies do to become more attractive and how do we rope in commercial investors in the calling sector thanks chat so, <clears throat> sorry um yeah i think uh well that's a it's a tough question i think um I'd say it's probably very hard. It's really hard for companies to attract commercial investors. But obviously, we've got Tracy and, and Dennis on the on the call today who can talk to that more. But I mean, they can obviously, you know, demonstrate good practice in their kind of operations, you know, good financial accounting, good good bookkeeping, have providing good kind of uh, after sales service, etc. Um, but I feel like we're at a point at the moment where the market needs to be more commercially viable. It needs to kind of show that, right? Um, so the role of um, EAP Africa, the role of the efficiency for XR R and D fund, and other key instruments, you know, I think it's all part of that um, market transformation kind of curve or approach, um, which is is key to build basically commercially viable markets um, and support those companies um, along the kind of runway, so that they're able to for the companies that would like to scale and grow. That they're able to to do that. Um, so um, the R and D fund is there to ensure that um, the companies that are wanting to develop new technologies um, and maybe edging into testing new business models that they have access to that support. And so that's what we're there to do in terms of uh, supporting development of um, kind of bankable technologies, I guess. Um, and I'd say also maybe like um, less focus on the R&D fund, there's just a need to prove kind of more successful use cases um, for investors uh, to see the kind of viability of the sector. Um, yeah, and that requires support from from us, basically the enabling environment, the donors and the funders and, every, and everything okay. else I, I kind of talked about um, uh, in the kind of initial framing remarks. So I, I don't see it falling squarely on the companies, but there's a responsibility um, on the kind of uh, the enabling environment basically mm, so indeed we have we all have a role to play um, in there to at least help companies access additional financing and to rope in those uh, commercial investors into the sector and uh, may i remind you that uh, should you have any questions uh, please post them in the chat box and uh, we will direct them to the panel at the end of the discussion I will move to Chris Emot. Chris uh, Acumen, you provide early stage um, equity uh, financing. Um, if you could also just speak to that financing component uh, and then also uh, get into what needs to be done to ensure inclusivity in access to cooling solutions for the bottom of the pyramid. So we have, you know, the, it, to striking a balance between having companies and allowing them to grow, uh, but also uh, ensuring that we're not leaving um, anyone behind uh, in this uh, in the sector. Chris? Sure. So yeah, so to try and get your first question in terms of, um, that's kind of what's needed for these companies. I think there's, um, Chris mentioned some some points that I just definitely uh, double click on in terms of kind of good book, bookkeeping and financial management is something which is which is really hard to develop when you're an early stage um, entrepreneur that's just kind of got a very limited team and is really critical to try and bring in other investors um, beyond the, the kind of grant capital initially. Um, the the kind of other element around around commercial viability and scalability is the other kind of big thing. So we are seeing some really innovative models showing kind of new approaches to, to how you how you bring your solution to to customers. But actually, it's it's much harder to really lay out a plan for how that can scale. Um, and so, so that's an area where we'd love to see 
kind of more more companies work with with the likes of support from EUP and and Layer to to work out how how do you take this solution which which has shown a lot of promise in in one particular geography one particular community and how that can actually be rolled out um, and on a kind of scalable basis rather than like a project by project basis. Um, on your second question around around what it takes for for these solutions to to reach the bottom of the pyramid, I think it's yeah, it's important to kind of recognize here that we actually have a real potential for innovators, both who are tackling um, you know, the last mile and really reaching those people living in poverty, but there's also a massive market for, for you know, making existing uh, supply chains more efficient, reducing waste within, within kind of corporate um, operations and stuff like that, and a real business opportunity there um, as well. In terms of trying to target that last mile, I mean, we've seen some great examples where, where community ownership has been really successful in terms of actually you're taking a very expensive product and getting a whole community to, to take ownership of that and sharing that cost across them. We've seen service models, so for example, how um, Dennis's model with Soccer Fresh and, and how that's actually bringing access to, to a community without them actually purchasing a product themselves. Um, but then we have also seen that there is there are niches where you can really have quite expensive products provide a real value to, to people living in poverty, even though it's it's quite expensive. So one example from our portfolio is Coolbox. Um, they have a, a sort of freezer that's really targeting um, kind of shopkeepers and, and market traders. So like a 200 liter freezer, not that huge. It's many hundreds of dollars, but because they've able to tap into end user financing and Pago technology. And combine that with the fact that they are working with entrepreneurs who are often using freezers already, but they're spending a huge amount on, on petrol generators to power them. It means that they're still really being able to reach the base of the pyramid. So 51% of their customers are living below the poverty line, even though they've, they've got a very expensive product and they're able to still pay for that product. But I think the, the kind of most important thing to recognize here is that Having access to cooling doesn't act automatically bring increased income for people living in poverty, and that's what's really key to scale. If people aren't seeing an increase of income, they're not going to be able to, to kind of take make the most of this, this technology. And so reducing post-harvest loss is a, is a great goal from a climate point of view, but actually I don't think it's kind of a, the real impact story and, and how, how you can see scalability. So these, these farmers, these traders, they need to have access to a market to be able to, to really make the most of, of cold storage. Um, so yeah, so kind of one example of that is is again the, on the community ownership side. So um, Promethean is one of our portfolio companies working in in the dairy value chain in India. They they get a, a community of of dairy farmers to to take ownership of a chiller, which then allows them to maintain the quality of the milk. But they that's definitely not the the end of it. If it was just that kind of chiller within within a village. There's limited impact that it's actually having on those dairy farms. And what Promethean is able to do is they're able to pay a premium for that milk because they, they can guarantee that quality. And they can also optimize some logistics by having that cold storage within the village. And so because of that, they're able to pay a premium price for the milk, offtake that milk from the farmers, and then those farmers are able to actually see an increase in their in income from access to, to that cold storage. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Thank, thank you, um, Chris and Tianda. I'll ask you uh, for your reaction on, um, you know, some of the, the nuggets that Chris has shared, particularly around impact um, and, you know, having uh, the technology does not necessarily translate to an increase in uh, livelihoods or incomes for the farmers. Uh, but as you uh, have a think on that as well, I would like to uh, bring in, um, you know, one one reality also that's on the ground, uh, which is cultural. Um, so as different models are being implemented on the ground, we have seen uh, a number of you know subsidies that are, uh, uh, are getting into the markets to support cooling solutions. Uh, Chris mentioned fee for service as one of uh, the models uh, that is being implemented, and Dennis here also is implementing that. But in some cases, uh, according to a few experiences on the ground, uh, culturally, people prefer owning an asset rather than renting. 
Uh, so with that in mind, do you see a role for some behavioral change work in increasing the uptake of uh, cooling solutions? And if that is the case, who has the responsibility to do that work? Tienda. Thanks, Jetsa. Um, yeah, no, it, it's very complicated. Like this, this the whole I mean, the different types of permutations between technology, business models, and most importantly, consumer dynamics. Um, and that's what, like, what Chris mentioned around uh, some of the work, uh, some of the partners that, that they support. So, for example, we work with Coolbox um, in, in Nigeria, where we are supporting them to extend the, the products into into mini grid communities and and so one of for, for example other challenges that we've seen is uh in the case where we want to target women entrepreneurs we find a reluctance uh by potential women end users to purchase uh freezers using the the the, the, the pay go model so and that's mainly because of some of the uncertainties that they have around uh being able to make enough money uh to to repay to repay this freezer so they're very very different challenges and, and 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 so that's why I was mentioning the, the important aspect of the consumer dynamics. But to your question around who actually is responsible to do that type of work, I think what um, I've seen personally uh, when, when going out into these communities is it needs somebody who's really incentivized to uh, to engage this community. So pro, pro service provision is 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 something that's really it's really challenging and not because of lack of trend, but because of the, 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 the reality of the markets that exist in some of these areas. So it's it's less about uh, the behavioral change work is, is just part of the larger uh, piece of work uh, that needs to be done around uh, reaching consumers. And so one of the partners that we work with uh, is a last mile distributor of agricultural equipment. So their work is to generate consumer leads understand what consumers understand what consumers need what the, what do the likes of cool box have to offer that meets these types of consumer needs understand what do this mean uh what's the pathway for for you to what's the payback period for some of this equipment based on what you're doing today and then so it's uh so that's one one like in, in terms of who actually does that the that last mile that last mile engagement uh engagement partner is just is, is is critical but obviously all the other layers that are going into it uh as you mentioned the rds the equity investments the technical assistance to really understand what what are we learning from from doing all this type of work um and and what can we improve uh, as, a, as a as a sector because all of this sits within an ecosystem like we are operating in an ecosystem where as much as we're operating in the energy ecosystem we are living in an ecosystem that is also largely impacted by agriculture by small enterprises so this how do we how do we grapple all that all of that because we are all just really responsible for a couple of things but how do we stitch that together in a way that uh that, that's sustainable over the long run thank you chanda and and i'm i'm cognizant that we are uh tight for time and uh i know dennis you have a hard stop at um in a few minutes uh at the hour so dennis if you may come in considering all these dynamics that we have uh been talking about on the demand side um we would like you know to hear your perspective on that and how you have been handling some of those issues and uh, if you may also just tell us your top three strengths that have enabled you to scale so quickly uh, as an early stage uh, company into where you are right now. Uh, and what do you need to go deeper into the underserved communities? Or is that even part of your plan to go even deeper, um, you know, beyond uh, the communities that you're serving now. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, well, uh, you have some tough questions, but I'll attempt to answer them. Um, so I think one, um, uh, when I, when I uh, when I'm listening to this conversation, um, the first, uh, I think what we have seen from particularly smallholder farmers and the farming community is that the technology by itself is not an end. What they are looking for is, or the question they ask is, how will this access lead to me earning more money, having more of my produce getting to the markets and accessing better markets? 
Um, and uh, answering those questions is really critical towards uh, accelerating the adoption of the solutions. Um, and so uh, even for our sake, uh, uh, what we've seen is that uh, uh, by just providing uh, pooling by itself was not a complete solution in the eyes of the farmer. Um, and so it's providing a, whole, a holistic uh, solution uh, for their post-harvest uh, challenges. And so we had to quickly develop a market access solution alongside the uh, pooling uh, to really be able to address the, the solution whole, um, holistically. Uh, and also realizing that the market actually was looking and waiting for someone to provide high quality produce consistently and that can only happen when you have this sort of aggregation infrastructure. So I think um, uh, being quite uh, empathetic and understanding uh, the, the core challenges that your customers face is important towards building a solution that is sticky. Um, and so that has been, uh, I think for us, what has really helped us to accelerate our growth as well as uh, looking and working with the right partners. So the challenges that are faced by smallholder farmers are quite uh, many and uh, we can solve all of them. I think uh, we sort of uh, agreed to focus on what we can do best and we asked ourselves what can we be best in the world at and that's aggregation and market access. So uh, in our journey we have uh, been quite open to strategic collaborations. We've uh, collaborated with companies that provide inputs for example um, and companies that provide logistic services, companies that provide post-harvest handling training, um, be able to really make sure that uh, we uh, we are able to provide uh, um, uh, all, all at the end that the customer who offtakes this product finds a product that is ideal for their requirements and increases the demand that they have, which means that farmers can then in the next season produce more. I think the other one is just for us to uh, having come to the realization that our solution is not a one size fits all. Each value chain has a lot of other dynamics. So uh, quickly learning the value chains where it's not easy for us to work in and where we are able to replicate has been also one of the key strengths I think for us. Um, and that goes also to the question about uh, reaching the underserved. We still see the need, for example, uh, in some of the regions here in Kenya to still work with um, development agencies uh, to sort of um, help us build a solid foundation before we have a fully commercial hub in some of those regions. So we've worked, for example, with the likes of the World Food Program and Concern Worldwide to reach uh, uh, farmers in arid areas where the challenges of uh, post-harvest loss are great, not just in fresh, but also in the meat value chains where Tracy is working in. And so sometimes you also have to look at uh, who can provide sort of uh, six months to one year of uh, accretion that enables us to serve some of those communities because uh, they have a big challenge. But uh, if you move in there as a startup, um, you, you, yeah, uh, I think it can uh, fully uh, uh, consume all the resources, the limited resources that we have. I think the last one is also uh, the choice of partners in terms of investors that you bring on board. We are very delighted, to, for example, to be able to work with Acumen, who not only are able to provide uh, um, uh, uh, investment uh, in terms of cash, but also uh, I have quite a number of uh, partners that can come and provide technical assistance where needed or, can, uh, or who we can pair up with to be able to reach new markets. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dennis. And I saw Tracy, you were nodding your head, um, agreeing with uh, what uh, Dennis was highlighting. And I would just want you to continue that that conversation, Tracy, and still speaking to the demand side. Um, there are projects that started off the same time as you. They set up uh, cold rooms uh, at the heart of the market, right where the customer is and yet their record utilization rates of as low as 5%. What is uh, Baridi's utilization rate and what have you done to ensure that uh, you have a high utilization rate for your solution? Uh, Tracy, you must be on mute. We cannot hear you.
Now we still cannot hear you uh, as uh, we are fixing that problem. Uh, the technical bit, we encourage you to send out your questions in the chat box and uh, we'll pose them to our panel um, once uh, we're done with the discussion. Tracy, you sound to, you seem to be sorted now. Absolutely. So I agree with Dennis. I mean, when we started Baridi, we entered the high volume urban markets. We charged a higher tariff. We charged five Kenya shillings. We had 70% utilization on one metric ton uh, assets, and we still weren't able to be sustainably profitable. So the cooling as a service model, I would say, even with higher tariffs and higher utilization rates uh, on a scalability level alone, may not be uh, the option. Um, what might be the option is to find off takers for these produce or to work uh, simply with B2Bs directly, right? So you work with a B2B, you sell these assets directly to either a foundation that will then convert it to a B2C model and you get your 30% margin and kind of leave that asset alone. Or you work with a corporate that wants to build a warehouse um, with pharmaceuticals and you get, again, your 30% margin and then you leave it alone. So a B2C model, whether you have 70% utilization or 5% utilization, whether you have a higher tariff or a lower tariff, when you're looking at cooling as a service alone is not commercially viable. Um, uh, market linkage may be a, may be a solution. Um, depending on the margins that you get on the produce, B2B I think is, is maybe the way to go. Uh, finding an untapped global market that wants to do warehousing cold storage solutions may be a better option, um, but really it goes, goes back to can these African consumers afford uh, these assets? And if not, uh, how long does the does the cold chain provider fight for this market uh, until they die off or do you go into the B2B model? So it really is a challenge. Uh, the cooling as a service model is not sustainable, whether you're doing it for livestock value chain, where you're charging a five Kenya shillings and making 70% utilization. Um, so it's a challenge and uh, of course, uh, thank, thank God for EEP and for grant-based financing for enabling this, this assets. But in order to commercialize this cold chain products, I think we need to look at a business scale. And I think we really need to kind of partner with more commercial uh, skills and even be more um, aware and able to pivot into pharmaceuticals. Um, uh, products. Uh, if you cannot get off takers for your clients who are putting their produce into your cold room, whether you're charging them 10 shillings or 5 shillings, it will not matter. So pulling as a service in itself does not make commercial viability, um, even though you make 70% utilization rates. So I think we really need to expand our options on uh, diversifying business models, right? So even for Baridi, we're looking at resale models, right? So where we're, we're looking at selling the produce of the clients, uh, almost like market linkage, but we source the produce not from the vendor directly, but from a cheaper source, and then maybe even selling to the vendor. So there needs to be diversification in business models, but otherwise the cooling as a service model, even with a higher tariff, doesn't make commercial sense um, and that may push most of these um, cold storage providers into B2B sales. I mean for us we did uh, B2B sales with 30% margins that kind of makes sense but then you see some of the earlier off takers also failing in that. Um, so yeah there's a, there's a big um, pragmatic issue when it comes to the cold storage solutions. I think maybe the only matter uh, to solve this is maybe warehousing, uh, just basically doing B2B sales or doing B2C sales where you're doing market linkage or some sort of uh, secondary uh, business model. And that's the honest truth in the market. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Tracy, um, for your insights there. I hope um one or two companies that are listening right now uh will find this uh useful and uh 
make use of uh, some of these learning nuggets that you have. I would like us to turn over to our audience uh, so that we can have you of the questions uh, that are coming on board. Um, and I will uh, invite my colleague, uh, Maggie or Maria, to help with uh, highlighting the questions. Yeah, hi, Chiedza. Hi, everybody. Um, we've received a number of good questions from our audience. So uh, here's one that might be quick for our entrepreneurs to answer. Um, what is the typical, somebody has asked, what is the, hold on. Uh, what is the typical payback period on these cooling assets? Right, so maybe I can answer that. So for us, we were doing five shillings per kg per day, and that's the highest tariff that you can get on any cooling as a service model. We were doing 70% utilization rate, and the lowest payback period that we could get was three and a half years. But when you're doing a B2B sale, um, and you're essentially putting a 30% margin, you can get two to three months uh, payback if you're essentially selling it directly to a consumer. Okay, great. Um, here's another question from the audience. Uh, somebody's asking, so what are the biggest lessons learned from the solar home system PAYGO sector? Um, <laughs> that keeps cooling entrepreneurs and ecosystem supporters up at night. So um, I was wondering if any of our panelists can can sort of speak to what's already been learned from that sector that could be applicable for this sector. I can try and attempt to answer that. Um, so yeah, so we've we've been invested in the Pago solar home system sector for a long time and, and seen some real challenges and some, some big failures in that space, but also a lot of a lot of real successes as well. I think the there's often an assumption with with cooling tech and um, and also the general like productive use appliances like um, solar water pumps and, and other things, that because this is a product that's targeted at businesses and targeted at, at the end user generating income from it, it will automatically have good repayments and it will be better than, than a household product where it's more of a, a kind of improvement in quality of life but it's not like essential to their business. I think this is a big a big mistake and something that we should really make sure that we don't kind of fall into that trap because without every, as everyone's kind of talked about, without the ecosystem around it, it doesn't necessarily automatically lead to, to improve the income. So without market linkages, without kind of really identifying a key niche where it provides sufficient value, it's not going to be automatic that you're going to have good repayments on that on that product. So I think keeping that focus on um, on your credit quality is is going to be key, and actually possibly even more than what we've seen in the in the solar home system, like the household lighting space, um, when you have kind of quite a mass um, a mass market with many 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 similar types of users who are seeing some kind of benefit from that product, and so you can have quite a generic credit assessment. In this space, you have different customers have operating different types of businesses getting different value from that product. Um, and so therefore, you need to be even more careful around your credit quality and your credit assessments. Thank you for that. Um, nobody else wants to weigh in. We did get a number of questions that were asking, kind of alluding to Chiedza's story in the beginning about um, different sort of needs of, of different products in terms of cold. So somebody's asking, how do you effectively manage the diverse storage temperature needs in different commodities in the rural market? Um, and what strategies have proven successful in optimizing cold storage facilities for maximum efficiency and profitability? Um, who can take that on from uh, the panel? And I think it also speaks to this one that uh, 
uh, is asking on sustain how sustainable is this model considering the size of the coolers, especially in remote areas, and uh, how do we handle issues of different crops since uh, crops require different cooling um, temperatures? Chris uh, Belland on the technology front, um, would you have any insights on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, basically, and I touched on it up front in the, the initial kind of comments is that different solutions designed, yeah, for different kind of use cases or purposes. I think that's really key. And Chris uh, from Acumen has shared their experience around like, you know, Promethean in, in India um, and, and other um, cold storage kind of providers. I think that's the kind of main thing I think that there's kind of specialization, I guess, of providers um, that can address these specific use cases. But I mean, to be honest, these use cases are still emerging, right? Um, in terms of um, viable kind of solutions or viable markets, perhaps. And um, primarily, I guess, like cold storage is is um, is primarily focused on uh, export markets to date. Um, but obviously, like organisations like Baridi are, are are not so much um, so far, um, more in kind of domestic markets. So yeah, I don't know if that really answers the question, but yeah, I think it's a kind of growing specialisation within providers. Um, yeah. Mm. Um, and uh, there is this interesting one on um, financing. So the path between catalytic or early stage funding and accessing commercial funding is a long one. Who are the missing middle finance players you see today um, most active in cooling? What is the biggest missing piece to accelerate the path? Um, I'll pose that to Chianda, Chris Emot. Chris, would you like to go first? Sure, I can uh, take it first. Uh, um, so I think there's, I don't think there's kind of one solution for that. There's, there's, these businesses are quite varied and working in kind of different geographies, different different value chains and stuff. So I don't think it's, there's like an easy answer. I think there's some a couple of really um, critical ones. I think there's a real role for venture builders. So companies which are organizations which are really taking very novel ideas and building teams around it. Um, this is the model which, which Soccer Fresh came out of and it really gave them the opportunity to experiment and understand the market context and, um, and really kind of play around with the space before arriving at a solution and trying to scale it up. That's like a huge luxury for, a, for an entrepreneur to have. And so I think really a really valuable support mechanism. So I'd love to see more um, funders kind of put more capital into that kind of space. The other area is, is patient capital, what we at Acumen do, trying to do early stage, stage investments. There's very few people trying to invest alongside us. There's only really a handful at the moment in the space. And without people who are taking taking companies from the grant stage to, to actually a formal institutional investor where we're putting in requirements for like legal stuff and having like proper boards um, systems in place in an organization is that the companies are never going to be ready for like a larger commercial um, scale investor and so I think having we have a very limited pool of, of capital at acumen and, and I'd love to encourage more more investors to try and get involved in this kind of early stage Risky space is still definitely this companies are really pivoting and still trying to find out where their product market fit, like you heard from from Tracy, and and there's kind of, there's still going to be more movement in the space. But once they find that product market fit, there's a huge potential. And so I think um, some real great opportunities to tap into for investors here. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh Yanda, um, we have a, a couple of questions uh, coming in. So let me move to the next question and anyone can pick it up. Uh, Chianda, you feel free to pick it up if that's okay. If fee for service is not commercially sustainable, what is the best model to provide smallholder farmers produce with access to cooling? Sorry, may I? Um, because I've been in this space. So I think. I think debt financing can come in if you have purchase order on direct sales. 
um, on these cold chain assets. It just depends on whether we want to be social entrepreneurs or we, whether we want to be high skill um, growth companies. So if you go to a company and say, hey, I have a purchase order to establish a high scale warehouse of a cold chain technology, that financing can come in relatively easily. I think that can come into cold chain if it's backed by B2B businesses. Um, but again, it just goes back to whether um, cold chain service providers must be kind of put into this um, scope of B2C um, elements, but you can get relatively fair B2B debt providers if you have purchase orders on the cold chain. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for that, Tracy. And I'm, I'm also cognizant that uh, uh, our time uh, has run out. Uh, and just to conclude the session, thank you for all the questions. We shall uh, attempt to answer directly uh, to those who have asked questions. Um, but just in, in conclusion, uh maybe in in one sentence uh from uh chris uh and um the, well, the two chris's and kianda what needs to be done to scale pooling solutions just in one one sentence cost reduction to get more technologies out there and plugging them into right business models which uh, tracy has uh passionately spoken about they just need to be taken up by the right types of business models. Chris, I'm yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, mine would be to focus beyond the technology and, and business models which look at the full ecosystem that can guarantee the improved incomes for, for end users and not just assume that would happen automatically. Great. And then finally, Chris Belland. Yeah, I agree with all that's just uh, been, been said. Um, and so would reinforce that. But I'd say like the, the enabling environment is really needed to provide that runway for companies. So when companies are emerged, like kind of have developed and fine tuned their product and it's ready for scaling, um, that the, the, the access to kind of the, the relevant support. So whether that be some kind of RBF or other kind of support that would be, uh, is key basically to see growth. Great, thank you. Thank you very much uh, to our panelists. Uh, for making time to share uh, lessons and your experiences in the cooling solutions sector. And thank you to all our participants for participating in this webinar. Please join us again tomorrow as we discuss our next call for proposals. Uh, we're also excited to be announcing uh, the project of the year 2023 and our rising energy leader tomorrow. So please do not miss it. Uh, there are lots of exciting developments as well uh, in the cooling sector. Please check out Gogla's website. There are uh, a number of uh, pure working groups uh, that are running and you can get more information uh, and additional publications uh, from their website. We've also shared uh, some sector updates and uh, publications. Uh, we are also going to share Chris Bellin's uh, framing remarks uh, after the session. Thank you very much uh, and enjoy the rest of your day.